Hi, my name is Jonathan, and welcome to the Haystack. I haven't done a video for a while, and uh, I do have planned an uh, interview with uh, Ed Goebel. Uh, he is with the channel Exploring the Restoration. Um, you may remember him from being over on Troy's channel. Um, what is it? The Last Dispensation. Uh, they, they've had some good interviews, and now I'm going to get a chance to interview with them. We were going to do that tonight, but we're going to end up pushing that and uh, getting a little bit more prepared for it. I also have another video planned that I want to do that uh, is actually linking out of all the things um, parts of Revelation, Isaiah, Joel, and the Book of Abraham, specifically concerning the facsimiles, which is weird because I've, <laughs> I've never really studied the facsimiles in, in any real depth before, um, other than just knowing what each of the things stand for and going, okay, I, I don't know much about this. But then the more and more I've been studying it, it, it's been blowing my mind. And this is one of the things that Ed uh, Goebel it covers is, is uh, his view on the facsimiles and the translation process and things like that. And he, he covers that with the last dispensation. We're not going to go over that so much. Um, but what I'm finding is uh, not the same as what he is. Yet, uh, as I've been studying more and more, I've been looking and trying to find what others have said on it. Now, pay attention to this. is <laughs> I, I had no idea that there were already so many um, sources. So, uh, um, like Hugh Nibley. I've never read any of Hugh Nibley's books. Uh, I've listened to his lectures time and time again, and, and I've, uh, any recording I can find of his, I, I've listened to, uh, I've never read any of his books, and I think that's where most of his, uh, in-depth explanations actually go into. When you listen to his lectures, he's rambling on real, real quick, trying to get as much information out as possible, and he tries to give some contextual stuff, but, you know, has to speed through, um, but I found that as I've taken an interest in understanding what scholars have said about the facsimiles and then what Joseph Smith has said, I started going, well, for the Rosetta Stone being found, like, only recently, and all this stuff, it's still pretty remarkable that Joseph, even if he tried to fake, I'm not saying he faked it at all. I'm saying he was absolute, it was absolutely what was intended to be translated and for our understanding and that there is more to be understood from it uh, for our day. So <laughs> he was on point. And so I've actually was uh, studying a lot of the things on there. Uh, the, the center figure you see in facsimile too. You see, uh, I, I don't remember what everything is called, but it, it's the center figure, and it's basically stating this is the throne of God, this is the time of Kolob, the thousand years, a day on Kolob is as a thousand years, in the presence of the Lord, kind of thing, and I'm, I'm botching it right now, because I'm, I'm just doing a real quick, uh, sharing of, of my thoughts on this. But then I noticed the, there's two figures on either side. And then there's all these other illustrations. And I'm thinking to myself, this must mean something. Because the facsimiles and the writing that was associated with it don't connect together. But they don't connect together with any Egyptian texts. Like, w when you see a facsimile of other things, the text next to it doesn't connect. So, that that's pretty normal. Um, 
that, that's a pretty common thing. But still, I wanted to know what the translation is. Because with Egyptian figures, they, they actually do represent letters that, that form a sound. And then you translate the, the sounds uh, of that ancient Egyptian into the common, what we understand now, and you can basically read the ancient hieroglyphics. But that's reading hieroglyphics and writing, and then they have a cursive style. Um, but what isn't so much uh, taught about ancient Egyptian, like when I try and look up understanding Egyptian hieroglyphics, it, it usually takes you through the alphabet. But it seemed to me that when they did a depiction or a picture, and they had all these different things associated, usually with gods or something like that associated, it was telling a story, and you had to really read it all together. And I'm not sure if there's a particular order, I'm sure there is. Uh, but it's supposed to be taken contextually and and really illustrate an idea of what is going on. Um, and so that's the way I've, uh, I've always understood, because that's the way we look at art and interpret art is, what is the artist trying to say? Why, why <laughs> go into to this detail here or list this? Why is there this included but this isn't included well i started doing that with that center figure because it's supposed to represent and show the thousand years but the the two there's two other drawings on either side along with other squiggly marks I realize those are baboons and the squiggly marks are snakes and um it, it's funny because when you look up the Egyptian translation of all these things, it's things concerning to do with death and resurrection, which the the Egyptians believed in heavily. Now, it was always my belief that they believe in that because it's what was left over. It, it's an apostate uh, revision of what they once had, which that seems to be accurate. <laughs> Uh, according to our uh, church scholars and things I've looked up. Um, so it's easy to say, uh, fact check, uh, it actually says this, not this. But then in later years it goes, well, it could be interpreted as meaning this, you know, th this thought process or... Uh, or this king, or this god, or this leader. Anyways, I, it, it, it just, there's so much stuff that validates what Joseph Smith had written. Um, but the point I want to get to is the baboons, which is weird, right? And the snakes. And I did a video talking about snakes. Snakes, at least. Um, but the baboons... I can't remember what the Egyptians used it for. They, they basically associated it with, with Thoth. So Thoth, you would see in their uh, depictions of Thoth, he looks like that e emu, I guess, not emu, kiwi, bird head. Um, and he's the scribe usually. So if you see the inscriptions or writings or, you can uh, generally see him being a scribe and writing someone um, the, the notes of a person who's being taken by an escort to Osiris or the king. And uh, they're also having their heart judged against this on scales with the feather. Then you usually have a crocodile underneath that will devour, consume you. And then you typically have 12 judges who are sitting in judgment uh, overhead. And so a lot of this is a parallel to uh, the endowment process. Uh, and Bruce Porter goes through this in great detail. 
he worked and studied under Hugh Nibley, uh, worked with Hugh Nibley, and looked at many of the papyrus and scrolls and inscriptions. And, and so he's a good living source to, to go to. Um, but so my idea of looking at these facsimiles is taking everything into context it really is teaching us about the endowment but more than that that center inscription where where Thoth and the baboons are associated together um, Thoth is also uh, depicted as an Enoch type that in the story of Enoch people tend to say the Emerald Tablet, I'm not sure what that is, but, but basically Enoch is, Thoth plays the role that Enoch plays for us biblically. Um, and so I thought a lot about that, that in that center section, it's talking about a thousand year period of time relating to the time of Kolob, but then it has baboons on one side and the other. And then there's the face the Lord is facing two different ways and talking about a thousand years the presence of God glory and I went I wonder if this is speaking about the city of Enoch and the millennial saints that it's specifically speaking about the morning of the first resurrection now, this is where the snakes come into play. Because, to me, snakes, if, if I were to look at the first original meaning, I would think that it would mean resurrection, that it's a symbol of living on and resurrection. Um, it just makes sense because it sheds its skin, leaves the its shell behind and it continues on living and so this goes back also to the Garden of Eden it's obviously why Satan would come in a form of a snake he's trying to come in the form of the Savior who will die for our sins and be resurrected um, and it kind of gave me more context of the story of Adam and Eve that, and if we were to even imagine ourselves as Adam and Eve, that you say you come across, you know, a yogi who themselves uh, claim to be highly spiritual beings who have uh, mastered themselves here in mortal life or in life and have overcome the world themselves, but without the need of a savior, that they did it all themselves, and that there is no savior, and, and that they return to be a spiritual being because that's the ideal life, is being as a spirit, and not, not a mortal, um, or not even having a body. And so they deny themselves the the lusts and enticings of the world because um, one they know it's they know it's a trap they know that if you gain this kind of enticing that your body is bound to this enticement and addiction but it's not just a physical addiction it's also a mental addiction it's a habit, it's a pattern, it's a desire, it's a craving. Um, and, you know, coming from me, I, I used to smoke cigarettes, I used to smoke weed, I used to drink. Uh, no desire for those things anymore. But I remember even, you know, years after I had quit, I still had dreams where I had a cigarette in my fingers. And I would bring it to my lips and I would scream and go, no, no, like not after everything we've done, like not, a, not, not after all the repentance, 
everything. I cannot, I don't want that separation again. I don't want that division. No, what am I doing? Why am I doing this in my dream? And you know, end up stopping myself, waking up and going, oh, it's a dream. <laughs> you know, um, Even as a missionary, I had a dream about uh, kissing a girl. <laughs> and I was like going, no, in my dream. <laughs> like, you can't do that. <laughs> well, uh, these guys, uh, yogis, it seems to me like they have a perverted form of Christ's teachings. Um, teach wonderful things, great things, but then they also um, discredit uh, all the things of repentance through Jesus Christ and take it as a more matter-of-fact and logical, you don't like it, stop doing it. It's over. Forget it. Move on. Um, overcome things. Why do you worry about this when there's this going on? And so there's lots of really good teachings. You know, like, like Satan. He'll give you wonderful good teachings. But ultimately, he wants you to leave the Savior behind. He wants that division in there. So to me... This is ideally why the adversary comes in the form of a snake. He's coming in the form of a, a savior. He's coming in the form of someone who has mastered all things and is of the resurrection. It, it's so specific of why that's even mentioned in Abraham. Of course they would mention that. It, it's, not, it's not because he's being sneaky. That's what we've associated after the fact. The original thing is because he's he's coming as the person who is trying to offer us salvation. And so we can see this in our own life. I mean, I don't think that yogis are, are awful, horrible people. <laughs> um, but I do think that when people, even when they naively do so, start directing you away from Jesus Christ, that's when you have to go, okay, this person, great motivational speaker, great, great books, you know, um, good guy, doesn't do anything wrong, he, he hates corruption, hates all the same things I do, but then says, but you, there's no need for a Christ, do it on your own, you, you do it all by yourself. There's no need for, for Jesus Christ. Oh, he died for you? That's great. He didn't have to. Uh, that, that is what should get your uh, senses going and going. Okay, okay. I have enough discernment to understand the, the division of glory right there. I've, I've seen your glory. It's a very selfish personal thing you could care less whether I follow you or not however Christ he overcame the world not just for himself but for all of us and gave us a path to do that and to continue to go on so when I see the depictions of those snakes it, it's on both sides with the baboons I would think that one baboon is the city of Enoch, who, uh, if you've watched Chris, Christian Homestead, he did a, a thing showing uh, how they, they're more likely than not already resurrected beings, which would make sense. And if we were to see them when they come and return, like in Genesis 9, and we we recognize them because we are like one another, I would assume that we would be resurrected beings as well. And if they are to return down here, and we have that morning of the first resurrection, that 1,000 year millennium, I don't think it's a mistake that God is telling us in that depiction. Not that that's how God would have depicted anything. That, that's how the Egyptians distorted true teachings to 
customize it to their culture and understanding. They changed it. You know, they, they put things in that originally were not. Um, and, I mean, there's reasons behind that, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, so, he's showing us what Abraham understands of of these writings and seals and teachings. It's like, yeah, Ham, Ham took this and spread it out through Egypt. And uh, he didn't have the authority as a priest. And so we see this distortion. It, the same distortion happened after the apostles were killed. There was a large distortion of truth. And so what we get from modern Christianity is going to be very different from what is restored. Just like how it was different when uh, Moses, you know, led his people out of Egypt. He had to restore much of what was already lost. When Joseph was taken captive into Egypt and still allowed to worship his God, he, and still he served Pharaoh and still he served under a, uh, a pagan government. And that, just like Daniel did with Babylon, it kind of teaches us that though there are some things that are not perfect with government, still the Lord can still use his chosen people to preserve a nation. And we can recognize the things that have been paganized or, or tainted through time or altered through time. And we may say, yeah, well, I mean, there, this actually means this. This actually means this. You know, it'll make a lot of Christians and people not like us. And that's fine. Um, that's what happened with Abraham. <laughs> that's what... Uh, Joseph likely learned from Abraham, Abraham's experience. No doubt he learned these Egyptian writings and teachings of Abraham, his grandfather, great-grandfather, through Isaac and Jacob, who passed it down to him, Joseph. And, and even the fact that Jacob gives Joseph that multicolored, uh, robe that illustrates that he's giving authority over to his son and the fact that it, it shows multicolors this is very beneficial especially through Egyptian perspective where all these different colors mean different areas of authority they have different meaning like gr yeah green blue yellow red all have specific meaning and authority to it so that is obviously going to be listed contextually uh, through the lens of the Hebrews who are coming out of Egypt. And it's funny, I was listening to a biblical uh, archaeologist, um, one who's literally his entire life is archaeology and, and he's got PhDs and all that stuff. Um, uh, Dr. Falk. Uh, I think he's a great guy. Uh, he definitely gives me more context. I don't take everything what he says as, as doctrine, obviously. But um, One thing I noticed is we see, like, uh, in Genesis with Joseph when it speaks about the priest of On, the uh, Potipharah. Potiphera and it's his daughter Aseneth that ends up becoming Joseph's wife that the 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 place of on the temple of on was in Heliopolis and they worshiped Amun Ra so that being the sun god and that likely also depicting uh you know, Jehovah and Jesus. How, how we have a differentiation of Jehovah and Jesus. 
they had Amun Ra. But through the Hebrew explanation, they called it On. And even the name Zath Beneth Benea and Potiphar, Potiphera, these names are not what was literally given um, by the Egyptians. It was what the Hebrews understood from these terms and wrote it down, uh, given an explanation. And then we also get the Greco translation of this <laughs> through time. So you look at Zeth Benath it's essentially saying the one who lives, showing that Pharaoh understands that this is the lost son, but he lives. Um, and, and that he's also the, the savior, the one who's been preserved, the, the one who helped Egypt. So they, they like throne, you have throne names, you have your real names, then you have like five names that you gain. And if you ever take on different titles uh, or areas like vizier or pharaoh or any of these other things, there's always so many names associated. But ultimately, when we're studying the book of Abraham, when we're studying any of these things, it, it just makes so much more sense now, understanding that how it all changed, why it all changed, and that it's not because people are being sneaky or deceptive, it's not because it's being made up, it's because that's just the way things have come through this particular cultural change. Look at the Hebrews throughout history. The world has hated them. They have been attacking and trying to destroy and discredit everything about the Hebrews and ancient Israelites. So that's that's a there's going to be some distortions and changes and people who are not accepting of of what is being offered by them on the other side they're not perfect and they're likely to um you know they they have variations of their own canon too but what we do have is a chain of doctrine from prophets we have understanding from Abraham given to Joseph uh, given to us and if we're not studying the scriptures and, and trying to understand what is the author or what is the Lord trying to say through this author or through this prophet and we aren't you know, inviting the Holy Ghost ourselves how are we ever going to understand what the scriptures say on a purely scholarly basis? It won't be done. Because look at a purely scholarly basis. What they'll do is they'll articulate that the facts are wrong. That technically it says this. Like technically it's talking about resurrection and and that this goes through the afterlife. But then I'm going... Uh, you you rearrange those words that the Egyptians gave in that inscription, and it sounds like what we hear in the temple. And so you look at the facsimile. I think it's facsimile too, and it, it's showing this passage of covenant keeping, even the four canopic jars, which illustrate. They didn't always have facial figures or animal figures on it. Uh, they used to just be jars. But they're to represent the four cardinal winds or corners of the earth. Now you read in Revelations and you see that in Revelations that the the four angels are to be loosed and and that when we gather Israel, it's from all four corners of the earth. We've heard over on Christian Homestead, he gave an explanation of this, that those four angels have been loosed already. Well, of course they have, because at least in, in my opinion and view, the, the four 
angels are representative of the priesthood keys which are restored, which are uh, coming through the earth. And, and it's those keys that give us the ability to gather Israel, to have the priesthood, to do baptisms, to build temples, and to seal on earth and in heaven. And it's all these things which must be sealed before Christ can come and the seventh seal is opened. And gathering of Israel is the work of salvation among the living and of those who are passed beyond the veil. So these four Kenobi jars you, you see in that, it, you, in, in what, that's one of the other facsimiles. There's four Kenobi jars under the sacrifice of Abraham. Really cool stuff into there. In fact, there's another channel that I will refer to um, that is reviewing all, all, all this stuff that I'm talking about. He actually reviews and reads everything in detail. And that channel is called Scriptures Made Simple. He does an excellent job, and for some reason, nobody's watching those videos, and, and you, you, gotta, you gotta check it out. Okay, so back to this. Uh, if you go to the facsimile 2, you have four figures, and they look like Kenobic jars, but these also represent the you know, four winds, the gathering, and everything. And looking at the order and seeing them flipped, uh, essentially seeing that they're on the other side of the veil, because the Egyptians believed in Ra uh, riding his chariot or the boat, I can't remember, uh, which was the sun, and it crossed, crossed the path of the sky. But during the night, he's traveling in the underworld. Uh, now you have depictions of a boat uh, with stars on it, representing, I can't remember, <laughs> but essentially the Egyptian belief is that you're traveling through the underworld to come back up, and then you have Apophis with the serpent, which is wanting to attack the snake, then you have depictions of a cat figure, uh, I can't remember the name, uh, one of the depictions shows this cat figure standing in front of uh, the tree, uh, a tree of life, holding a feather-looking dagger that looks like a flame, and he has his heel on the serpent's head, Apophis's head. So I actually asked the archaeologist about that and said, is this the same? And he's like, no, this is what it says in Egyptian, that's what it says. And I'm like, do you think that could have been distorted? He's like, uh, it, I, I, I'm not going to make assumptions, there's no evidence for it. Um, I, I can't make a claim like that. And I'm like, that, that's fair. That, that's, the, that's the realm that you live in, is academia. You're not allowed to think of things outside of having evidence for them, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, of course he's going to say. D could it have been that at one point? I can't say. Me? I could say, yeah. Definitely, I believe that. <laughs> okay, so. But, um, so to me, the, these four angels in Revelations, the four Canopic jars, the, the four winds, the four corners of the earth, uh, the fact that they build pyramid two. Uh, pyramids with these four corners that insert that have the dimensions and mathematics that uh, match up with the circumference of the earth and uh, and that you even have a sphinx in front and I, I doubt that it had a human face to begin with uh, because it seems that the the cat figure the protector in other words maybe the cherubim is what stands between you uh, or stands between Apophis and the gathering at the end of all things. It, it's the protector, it's, it's the tree of life, the, the pyramid 
Uh, I'm not going to get into that because I've had a lot of thoughts and I've written them down. I haven't heard others share the same thing, so I'm hesitant to to share them. But to me, it's it's all stuff we learn in the temple. Um, uh, and it goes into great... You can learn things in a lot more detail and you have to use your judgment and, and discernment of what has been distorted and what is part of likely the original source. But these winds which go and gather, it's, it's almost as if it's this missionary work, temple work, it's the priesthood. The priesthood are it's the winds which go and gather the elect and bring it into one great whole for that time of when Zion above and Zion below meet together and are in that glory of the Lord. They have that morning of the first resurrection. They're, they're at the wedding feast there. Notice the, the wedding feast, all of that, that, that's what Jesus gave as a understanding for his coming because it was a Galilean wedding feast that he's relating to and he's relating to Galileans. So understanding the context, the culture, the, the, it's, it's very important and it's so, it communicates so much more because how it would be related today is what we would see likely in conference talks. It's something uh, Elder Uchtdorf may relate it to, to flying in airplanes. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's really taking eternal truths and breaking it down to the audience's understanding. And when you have audiences, generations down the line, they're probably not going to understand it exactly the same. And so this is where people read scriptures and they go, this is stupid, I don't understand it. Well, of course you don't understand it. I mean, you're just reading it for the first time. You just read uh, your first time uh, through the scriptures and you, you have the fairy tale version of the Bible rather than the contextual understanding. You get the milk before the meat. The meat comes when you it, It's so much more invigorating when you find it yourself and when you don't give up. People give up on God because they don't understand what he has already given us. And it's because the adversary has made us so accustomed to fast-paced dopamine releases and enticements that the subtle things that the Lord has always offered and is always there, they they get overshadowed or they, they get unrecognized because he wants our attention. He wants us busy, busy, busy. He wants us focused on things that don't really matter. Now, all of us, we're living better than kings back in any given generation. We're living way better. Even if you're in a studio apartment, five people in, living in the same place, uh, living on food stamps, it could be worse. And may get worse. The thing is, is we're being tested to have great poise we're going to be taken through some trials and you got to believe that us most pampered generation of all time we're going to have some distinct challenges to test our character in the face of hardship it's easy to do things when things are easy can we maintain that when it's hard Even when the kids are screaming, fighting each each other for wanting the same color pencil uh, or crayon, yeah, it may be frustrating immediately. But if you were to imagine yourself as a 80-year-old man and you got to go back in time for a single day, and that was the moment that you got, or 80-year-old woman, 
and the moment you got with your child was 10 minutes with them of them fighting you would cherish it so just take all that reflect and have a good day